I want to finish chapter two for tonight. Do not love the world. We got in on that verse um, last Wednesday evening, but I want to um, mention a few more things about verse number 15 on do not love the world. When John is speaking here, remember he is speaking against the backdrop of, of a false teachings that were coming into the church and those that thought they were superior Christians and they had superior knowledge and um, all of these things that uh, certainly were against uh, what the gospel message was all about. And Paul goes on and he speaks about the ones in the church and last week we looked at the little children, the fathers, the young men talked about spiritual maturity growing in grace and um, uh, for the year 2024 to try to mature in our faith more than we ever have in our lives. When I alluded to the fact last week on do not love the world or the things in the world, we spoke about a world system out there that is anti-God a world system that wants nothing whatsoever to do with a creator God that would give these principles and commandments and precepts in his word, but a world system that wants to uh, live life, do life from a secular point of view, a secular world of view, a view that totally has nothing to do whatsoever with the biblical world of view. And so, under that umbrella of that world system, and as the world is moving closer and closer to that coming day when there will be a one world ruler and a one world religion and um, all of the things that will take place during that period of time we call the tribulation, and the last three and a half years, the great tribulation when the Antichrist uh, makes uh, those take a mark where uh, they are worshiping him as God and God alone. But even when John speaks about do not love the world or the things in the world, I want you to think with me tonight, uh, just uh, interact with me if you will. What are some things in the world tonight that people seem to love more than they love God or things that they certainly put ahead of God? What, what are some of the things you notice? Sports, money, power, themselves, self-love, family, status. Anything else? What? Oh, Julia said sex. Uh, well, certainly if you look at television and commercials and uh, all of the... No, y'all don't make me laugh. <laughs> I'm trying real hard to keep a straight face, but some of you are sniggering, and I'm one of those guys, it, it, if I see somebody laugh, it may be at the inappropriate place, but I just cannot help it. Uh, you know, and, and so, uh, uh, yes, Julia, you are correct. Uh, we see it on billboards, we see it on television all of the time, we see it in ads that are out there, and you are definitely right, Hollywood uh, promotes that, and uh, we're living in a world today where people are much more accepting of things that we once frowned upon, and of course with the internet and uh, the click of a mouse, um, kids, adults, senior adults can be in all kinds of dating sites all over the world. Uh, people can be in all kinds of pornographic situations that are out there. All of these are under that umbrella as well of love, not the world or the things that are in the world. I want to ask you a question tonight. Just search through your mind for just a second. Are there things that you have in your possession? Phones. 
<laughs> phones are definitely, I mean, if we lose our phone, uh, I was in a store the other day here in town and, and one guy was in front of me, it was in the, the uh, drugstore, and uh, he bought something. He said, that's the best invention that was ever made. When he left, I didn't know what it was. I didn't look at it. And I said to the one at the register, what was that he bought that was the greatest invention? And she said, a phone charger. A phone charger. I want you to think about that tonight. We are so addicted to phones that, goodness gracious, if we lose it, we just go into some kind of a spell, don't we? And they make all kinds of things now that you can use a whistle in your phone, will tell you where it is, and all of these gadgets. But whenever you think about things out there that really control who we are and what we are, and, you know, God didn't expect us to go through the world to not have things, as we see in biblical days, uh, back in past history, God blessed uh, through many of uh, the people that are recorded in the Bible, and they were blessed with wealth, some of them. Some of them were poverty-stricken. But, you know, whenever we put anything ahead of our love and devotion and passion to Christ, then it is a part of that system of loving the world, of loving the world. How many of us tonight, don't raise your hand, please. How many of us really need to clean out our closets? How many of us really need to get rid of a lot of things uh, that we have in our lives? Uh, and so when, when John is writing to the church here at Ephesus, he's saying, don't let this world system and the things that are against Christ and against him, his deity, and his humanity, and, and the things that we attach ourselves to, he's trying to say, do not let those become something that would keep you from loving the Lord with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. And so he says, do not love the world or the things in the world. And then he goes on and says, if anyone loves the world... The love of the Father is not in him. John is specifically trying to say that there were people in his day, as there has been since the book of Genesis and through the millennia of time, there are people that love the world. They love this world, and uh, they do not want to leave this world. Now, I, I'm sure that none of us here tonight one on the next lifeboat going out. But we, we sometimes attach ourselves to the things of this world rather than thinking about heaven, thinking about eternity, thinking about what God has prepared for those who love him. And so John very succinctly, he very definitively says to his congregation and to you and me today, don't let this world system and all of the things that tug and pull at us, uh, John is saying, do not let that in any way become a part of your life that would take you away from your first love. If you will remember, as he's writing from Ephesus, when you get to the book of Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 and we're given the seven letters to the seven churches, if you will remember, later the church at Ephesus had left their first love. And of course that was to love the Lord Jesus with all of their heart, with all of their soul, with all of their mind. To love him in every area, every capacity of their life. He goes on in verse number 16. He says, for all that is in the world, and he's going to give us three things that he wants us to focus in on, to comprehend, to 
not let it become a part of our life. Even though we as Christians are in this world, we do not have to be of this world. And so he gives these things, the desires of the flesh. I think that all of the things that you mentioned tonight, all of these things are desires of the flesh. If you go back to when uh, Eve was in the garden and Satan comes, when she saw that fruit from that tree that God had specifically said of all of the trees in the garden, they're yours, but of this tree, don't eat. You know, even though we understand what God was saying there, have you ever thought about that in the Garden of Eden, man was given a free will to choose? It was there that you and I see with our physical eyes, but even to a much deeper extent, our spiritual eyes, that God said, Here's all of these trees that I'm blessing you with, but leave this one alone. A free choice, a free will. Satan didn't like that. Satan comes into the garden. He begins to distort. Did God really say? Is that what God really means? And so John says, for all that is in the world, he says, the desires of the flesh. You and I live in a fleshly body. We may be saved if we have done what Jesus told Nicodemus to do. You must be born again. And if we are born again, if we truly, if genuinely trusted Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, then the Holy Spirit lives within our heart. God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit is a comforter. The Holy Spirit goes with us wherever we are. The Holy Spirit leads us into all truth. The Holy Spirit is that inner conscience within us that whenever we do something wrong, immediately a warning sign comes up. And those warning bells begin to sound in our lives. And we immediately know because the Holy Spirit has alerted us to the fact that the flesh is either overriding the spirit or it is getting to a place where it perhaps will choose its free will to have the desires, those fleshly desires. And must I say, Hollywood out there, liberalism out there that's in the world, all over the world tonight, all of these things that are vying for the attention of humanity. And so the desires of the flesh, all of us, We've heard the various things that have been mentioned tonight, sports and money and sex and, and self-servantship, self-love, all of these things, these gadgets that we have that we think we cannot live without. I was reading two or three internet articles in the past week that was saying, talking about how various places will not take cash anymore and that it's creating a huge problem in people's lives. Well, may I just say it's a precursor to what's coming down the pike. And so the desires of the flesh, the things that we desire. He goes on and then he talks about the desires of the eyes. Let me tell you, Sunday morning, I'm going to be preaching out of Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 14. When life is all over the place and in the in-between, where do I go? What do I do when I'm in my wilderness? Speaking about Jesus after his baptism, being led into the wilderness. 
by the Spirit, by the way. And so we're going to look at that Sunday morning. What does that mean? What does that teach us? The desires of the eyes. Satan came to Jesus in the three temptations of Christ. And some of them dealt with the flesh and some dealt with the, the desires of the eyes and some dealt with the pride of life. But the desires of the eye. And whenever we see all the promotional advertising going on in the world, let me tell you, then the flesh begins to rise within us. I dare say tonight, and I say this unashamedly, and I say this very boldly, that I think one of the great problems in the church I think one of the greatest problems among people who profess to be born again, I think one of the biggest, biggest issues is whether or not I walk in the flesh or do I walk in the spirit. As long as you and I live in a fleshly body, we are going to have those two things bombarding us, vying for our attention. And as long as we are in this fleshly, earthly body that is bent towards sinning, we are going to be bombarded with all the flings and the arrows of Satan that he has as tools in his arsenal of deception and lies to us. I don't know how many articles I've read in the past week, and I'm, I, I hate to say, among Southern Baptists, and how so many things are happening in various churches from the cover up of sexual abuse that has been going on for years, and the lawsuits now that are being brought by those victims, and the amount of monies that is going to take from the offerings that are given and insurance companies and premiums and all of these kinds of things, not to mention what's happening among uh, Methodism and Catholicism. And so... It's so sad. I've read so many of those this past week and, and people that are in high positions. And so sadly, the desires of the eyes and the desires of the flesh, Satan is well versed in knowing what lure to fish for in all of our lives. And if we're not walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, then we're walking in the frailty and the power of the flesh. And so that's why the Bible says, be on guard, your adversary, the devil's like a roaring lion that walks up and down, seeking whom he may devour. We'll see Sunday morning how that he left Jesus for a little while. Let me tell you, Satan will leave each one of us for a season, but he always comes back. He always comes back knocking, and I think one of, one of the biggest things that is creating in the lives of Christians all over the world tonight, I think one of the things is that Satan has perpetrated his deception, his lies, and people fall into the power of the flesh and succumb to those temptations, and then they become very depressed. And God doesn't love me anymore. Uh, God hates me. What have I done? What did I do? Trust me. I've gotten some texts like that in the past week. Why does God hate me? What have I done? And you know, each one of us, I know a saying from years ago, every tub sets on its own bottom. 
every one of us live life every single day with choices that we make. And the consequences of those choices will determine how much influence will we have. When we looked at Jabez's prayer last Sunday morning when Jabez prayed, enlarge my territory, speaking about his influence in the world and what he could do and how God would bless him. Let me tell you, I think as Christian people, you and I are in a place today where the news media is criticizing evangelicals. Because they're saying evangelicals are using their evangelicism, evangelicism, however you want to say that, in the political arena, and they see it as hurting the term evangelical. And so everywhere you and I turn, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes. And then notice John speaks about the pride of life. In the book of Proverbs chapter 6, there are seven things God hates there. And one of them is a proud look. Pride, the pride of life. Thinking You are superior in some way to someone else, whether it's a race issue or whether it's a a knowledge issue that you assume somewhere along the way that you have superiority over everybody else. And one of the things that the Bible speaks about greatly is pride and arrogance And those kinds of things. John is reminding the people of Ephesus about these things to watch out for, to be on guard for. They're a part of that world system. You see, you and I live in a world that is called post-Christian now. It's also called a world of subjectivism. There are no moral absolutes. Therefore, whatever feels good, do it. If it works for you, then it's up for your grabs. It's subjective to whatever situation you're in. If it doesn't bother you and it looks okay to you, then it's okay. But let me tell you, all of that is contrary to a biblical worldview and to the spiritual growth of a person who not only professes to be born again, but is in certainly possession of being a born again child of God. John warns about this world system that we are in. When I think about our young people, when I think about our youth, let me tell you, many of you out there grew up in a different time, a different era of time. And you could not have thought 40, 50, 60 years ago that we would be seeing what we see today. Let me tell you, you better be praying for your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. You better become their advocate and intercessory prayer to the Father for these children and these young people because let me tell you, they've got a hard road to hoe. Because there's so much coming at them in every direction. They're overwhelmed. Never before in all of human history has there ever been, let's take in America, the depression among young people, the isolationism among young people, the loneliness among young people that is being created by the media It's being created by uh, TikTok. Uh, It's being created by the internet and all of these things. And while some things are good, Satan turns and twists and uses them to bring confusion into the hearts and minds of impressionable people. And so John is going to tell us right here 
that all that is in the world, the, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And this world system, that's a godless system, that is a system that is against everything that Christ would be. John has told us already that in his day, there were these antichrists. The word anti means against, or it can mean instead of, or an imitation of. And the word Christ there, meaning against Christ, or an imitation of Christ, or in place of Christ, and then he refers about the one world and a Christ coming someday. John is giving some great words of wisdom, some great words of pearls of, of wisdom that we can take and apply in our hearts and lives. He's given also a word of warning. Notice in verse number 17, he says, and the world is passing away along with its desires. Notice that, the, and the world is passing away. Did you realize tonight that this world is a temporary world? It's a temporary world. It's passing away. It's dissipating day by day by day. The world is not getting better. The world is becoming worse and worse and worse all the time. And the world, he said, is passing away. John is saying, don't get caught up in this world. Don't get caught up in the trap of a temporary fix because he's saying all of this is a godless system. He says, and the world is passing away along with its desires, these desires of the world. One of these days, these things are going to come to an end, as 1 Corinthians 13 speaks about. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God, I want you to notice that phrase, but whoever does the will of God. What is the will of God? The will of God is that you be saved. The will of God is that you study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The will of God is that we grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The will of God is that we carry out the great commission and the great commandment, and that we abide in his love and in his commandments and the principles and the precepts that are taught from the word of God. But whoever does the will of God, John said, abides, notice, forever, forever. Verse number 18, children, it is the last hour. Now, you can say, I heard somebody on a podcast this week say, well, you know, people have said for years, uh, you know, there are earthquakes and there are hurricanes and there are tornadic activity and there's all of these things, floods and all of this kind of stuff. Well, you know, the Bible says that there'll be scoffing in the last days over things like that. Where's the promise of his coming? Let me tell you, yes, there have always been those things. But the prolificity of those things have increased exponentially over the years and are increasing all the time. I don't know if any of you uh, saw on the news today, I read one of the news articles that is coming to Oklahoma City down in Bricktown. It's going to be called Broadwalk at Bricktown. It's going to be the tallest skyscraper in the entire world, or, or at least in America. I think it will be the sixth of the tallest in the world, and it's going to be 1907 
feet in the air, the 1907 comes from when Oklahoma became the 46th state in the Union. And when I read that and I saw that there are going to be three other towers that are some 30-something stories each, some will be retail, some will be condominiums for people to live in that can afford them, I'm sure. Uh, and some of those are going to be restaurants and hotels. And then you've got this 1907, that would be 190 stories tall. When I read that, I began to shudder. When I went up into the Williams building when it was built in Tulsa and looked down from the 50th or 60th floor, I, I was like, Miss Chris, well, get me out of here. I, I, I don't like heights. But I thought about that, and I thought, you know, I'm grateful that Oklahoma's getting that. And they were talking about how Oklahoma City is expanding and growing, and, and it's amazing that it is going to be built there. And I'm grateful for that. But you know, even with all of these kinds of things out there in the world, let me tell you, the, this world is passing away. Children, it's the last hour. Yes, it's been the last hour since Jesus came 2,000 years ago. That's when the last hour started ticking away. And John says, children, it's the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist, small a, that is speaking about anti there, A-N-T-I, made out of two words, the preposition A-N-T-I, and the word Christ, once again, anti, against, in place of, the imitation of, antichrist there. John is saying there have been antichrist for years out there in the world. They're against Christ. They're against his kingdom. They're against anything that is godly. It's the last hour, and as you've heard that antichrist is coming so many antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. And when you see the big capital A, you know it's referring to that last world dictator that is coming. You know, when John said the world is passing away, let me ask you a question. Did the Egyptian kingdom pass away for the most part? Didn't the Assyrian kingdom pass away? Didn't the Babylonian kingdom pass away with all of its glitz and glamour and glory and gold? Didn't the Greek and uh, didn't that kingdom pass away? The Medo-Persian kingdom and the Grecian kingdom and the Roman kingdom, except for the small parts of it that are still at play in Europe, the ten toes on the statue and Daniel's prophecy, which represent the revived Roman Empire, the ten league nations of the world that will rule under the auspices of the Antichrist someday. John goes on and says, therefore, we know that it is the last hour. Let me tell you, we know that it is the last of the last hour because on, what was it, May the 12th, 1948, 4 o'clock p.m. in the afternoon that Israel became a nation in one day's time. And so we begin to see the things that happened from 1948 to 1973, Yom Kippur War, the Six-Day War, when God sent his angels to help the nation of Israel. And now Israel is embroiled and embattled in this war over there in Gaza and now you've got all the anti-Semitism that's going on all over the world and in America. And they had people on the news last night speaking that this has to end, that America has to quit doing this, 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 and this. And so all of these things are out there on the stage of life. They're being played out. The players are out there on the world stage. Let me tell you, there is a God in heaven and I can promise you tonight, nothing has caught his attention by surprise. He's at the control. He's moving the pieces 
on the chessboard of life. He's moving people and nations into places. He will even take evil, wicked, rogue nations in order to use them for his eternal elective purposes, even though you and I cannot in this finite body of ours quite understand that because his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And therefore, we can only understand and comprehend what he wants us to understand and comprehend. Notice in verse number 19, John says, they went out from us. Now, we're probably going to have to stop here on verse number 19 because I want to camp here for a while. They went out from us. John speaking about a group of people that it looked like they were part of them. It looked like they were Christians. I was reading today about Judas Iscariot. And uh, when Judas Iscariot, um, uh, well, in fact, turn, if you will, to page 1136. Just read it with me. 1136, John chapter 6 and verse 70. John chapter 6, St. John, verse number 70. Jesus answered them. He's speaking here. Did I not choose you the 12 and yet one of you is a devil? Let me tell you, those disciples had Judas carry it in their circle. Judas was there with them to help perform miracles. Don't ask me to explain all that. But he saw all the things that was done, being done, Jesus did, the power of the Spirit allowing them to do and be a part of. I mean, he looked like one of them. He smelled like one of them. He acted like one of them. But yet he was a devil, a demon. When they were all there at the upper room at the Last Supper, Peter and John's having a conversation across on the on the other side of Jesus and, and Jesus tells them one of them's going to betray him and they're all looking goggly-eyed at each other wondering who is it? Who's he talking about? And Peter, he's trying to get the attention of John. John, why don't you ask him? And Jesus says the one that, dip, that takes when he dips the bread in, into the liquid there would be the one Little did those disciples know. The Bible says, and then Satan entered into Judas. In other words, to do the dastardly deeds that he would do to the Lord Jesus. And yet they thought that Judas was one of them. I mean, he carried the purse. He carried the money. He was the treasurer of the deacons. Goodness sakes forbid that any of them would think that Judas wasn't one of them. John speaks here in the book of 1 John telling about some that had come in the church. They went out from us, but John says, but they were not of us. John says, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. Now, he's not talking about people that change memberships in a church, although that could be, I suppose. But he's talking about people that profess to be something that they were not. Professing to be something that they were not. John went on and said, but they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. He made it pretty plain, didn't he? You see, no wonder, I think that fits right into in the last days when they'll say to Jesus, hey, we preached in your name, prophesied in your name, we cast out demons in your name. Jesus said, depart from me. I never knew you. Those are some of the saddest words in all the Bible. Depart from me. 
I never knew you. And John nails this in the midst of the background of the Gnostics and the Gnosticism coming in, and they were denying the deity of Jesus. And folks, let me tell you, if God coming to earth in his incarnation, meaning his flesh, if God and Jesus were not fully human and fully divine, then you and I would not have a chance at salvation. Let me tell you, there are people in the world that deny. There are church people in churches that deny the deity of Jesus. They deny that he was fully human. Why did God come down here robed in flesh through the second person of the Godhead, the Son? Why did he do it? so that he showed to us he understands humanity. He was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin, the Bible says. And so he experienced all of the temptations that you and I experience. Jesus understands grief and sorrow. He understands pain and loss. He understands when you and I don't understand. He understands when we don't get it, when we don't understand it. He understands because he took upon himself the human side as well as his divinity. He was fully divine, fully God. He was fully human, the God-man. And so, it is vital to Christianity. It is the framework. It is the cornerstone, the linchpin of Christianity that he was the God-man. He was fully human, yet without sin, and fully divine and yet there are many churches and denominations and people in various churches. There are people in Baptist churches that deny some of these things. Folks, let me tell you, some in John's day were saying Joseph was the father of Jesus. No, he stepped in, but he did not father him. Had he done that, Jesus would have been no different than any other human being that was ever born. And so John is writing because of these that have crept into the church and were preaching and teaching all of this stuff that was contrary to the deity of Christ. And John says, there were people in that church. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. In other words, they would continue to believe the truth of what he's teaching and, and preaching. But they went out that it might become, notice, plain. That it might become plain that they are not of us. How many people are you reading about today, hearing about that for years they professed that they were born again and now they're giving up their faith? Well, that fits right into what John was saying that was happening in his day. They went out from us, but John said they weren't of us. Let me tell you, Judas is carrying went out from the disciples on that night. But he wasn't one of them. Oh, sure, he had walked with them. He had been with them through the miracles, the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000, watching the lame 
be made to walk in the blind, be made to see in the dumb, be made to speak. He was a part of all of that. But he was not one of them. And they did not see that. They did not understand that. So as Paul says in the book of Corinthians, let a man examine himself. Let a man examine himself to see if he's in the faith. God bless you for coming tonight. I don't want to wear you down, but uh, I appreciate your, the way you listen and hopefully we're making this clear and plain and simple that we all grasp it and that we all understand it. Someone made a comment about the youth and how quiet they are, how, in, how intuitive or how sensitive they listen on Sunday morning, and they do. They don't sit there and write notes and back and forth, but they're focused in. And uh, I'm so thankful and so grateful for them. And uh, I try to turn to them and let them understand the importance of what we're doing because they'll be out in the world before long going to various universities and colleges and hearing various college professors and different ideologies that are out there in the world. And you have to make a choice. Am I one of us or do I go out from, a, from us? Judas Iscariot, he wanted out of that meeting in the upper room. And Jesus was said, whatever you do, do it quickly. Jesus would go out, Judas would go out, take 30 pieces of silver to betray Christ in whom he had walked, in whom he had seen these incredible miracles that he performed, but he was not of the fold that those other 11 disciples were of. And you know, you and I come to church I can't see your heart. You can't see my heart. But there's one who can. And the book of Samuel says, man looks on the outward appearance. I'm sure that's what those 11 other disciples were doing. They were looking at the outward appearance. The book of Samuel says, but God looks at the heart because he is the great cardio. Gnosis. Would you stand as we pray together tonight? We'll pick up there next Wednesday evening. Father God, thank you for this time we've had together. God bless these as they come from week to week as we grow in your grace and in your knowledge in this new year. Take each one safely home tonight, oh God, I pray, and return us back on Sunday morning with a passion in our heart to serve you more fully and more spiritually in this new year. In Christ's name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Looks like everybody's home folk tonight. So would you turn around? What a great Wednesday night group. Thank you for being here this evening.